I'm, I'm humbled by uh, being invited to, to speak. And uh, I don't want this to be a lecture. I've been in here before um, for, for different occasions, and uh, I find it to be more interactive. Let's have a discussion about what's going on in our country. Um, and I think it's a timely discussion where there's some societal issues that are overlapping with technological solutions. A uh, very interesting time that we're living in and, and how fortunate we all are to be here in the Polytechnic uh, Institute here at Purdue as we're, we're studying technology to solve the problems of today and tomorrow. And I think that's where I'll, I'll start. Um, just in my timeline here, uh, at point number four, if I go backwards, uh, as as your chief of police here in West Lafayette for 11 years, in the midst of my uh, of of my job and in that leadership role, I decided to pursue a master's degree here at Purdue in technology. I recognized I, I came back from the FBI Academy, uh, and I had some uh, some leverage and some some credits actually, some some um, graduate school credits that I wanted to turn in. Uh, to something, to parlay it into um, a degree. And at the time, this was 2011, 2012, there was this interesting concept going on in our country about police body cameras. And most, uh, most jurisdictions thought it was a novelty and uh, it, would, it would be a phase, it would come and go. Uh, but I recognized early on that it was something, uh, as I started in the, in the College of Technology in 2012, that's what it was called back then, uh, that it was something that um, I recognize as probably being the next wave of technology for police officers. Uh, addressing points of accountability and transparency. I remember our officers going on uh, calls for service in about 2010 to 2012, as the iPhone became really um, uh, commonplace with our college population here, our, our college residency. And I, I think um, w our officers were going for calls for service specifically in the Purdue Village. And they would roll up on a fight call or uh, an incident where they're having to take law enforcement action and everybody's got their iPhone out and they're recording our officers doing their job but they're doing it maybe from across the street, from 40 feet away, and they don't have a beginning to end. They don't have the interaction of the dialogue between the officer and, and the people that they're dealing with, and conclusions can be made, um, uh, downloads to social, uploads to social media, and maybe not tell them the complete story of what was going on. And if you're in a college environment, I think it's exponential that you recognize these trends, specifically these technology trends, because you all are on the cutting edge of that. And I think you, um, you, you help us older people, and I, I think I'm old enough to be everyone's dad in here. I have uh, two kids at Purdue and one at that other university in Bloomington, so we send checks to both. But uh, I've always found uh, being in a, in a college environment keeps you – um, a, a very uh, uh, cutting edge on technology. Certainly here at Purdue that was the case. So fast forward, um, Purdue University played a large role, and specifically uh, the College of Technology back then, played a huge role on where we are today in Indiana and really across the country with body-worn cameras. So just in the last hour, the Derek Chauvin trial uh, has come to an end. There's been a verdict uh, announced, uh, guilty on all charges. And a large piece of what we're living right now was video from body-worn cameras. And we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. And I'll remind you, please stop me, interrupt, raise your hand if you have something to, uh, to add or ask about a point that I'm making. Uh, because this is really timely stuff. Where we were just less than 10 years ago, where we are now, and, and where we're going. Uh, 
full disclosure here, I do work for a body-worn camera company. I'm the director of law enforcement relations for Body Worn by Utility, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I operate from here in West Lafayette, though, but I travel quite, quite a bit, extensively, across the country, and I, and I, and I talk about this subject. Uh, not as a salesperson, I'm not on the sales side of the house, but policy, technology, and educating um, a lot of our law enforcement community and doing a lot of talks like this. Last night, uh, I was uh, on a Zoom meeting. I did a presentation to the Alaska NAACP as Anchorage is getting ready to deploy body-worn cameras and giving them some, uh, some points, uh, some relevant uh, policy of where we are in the law enforcement sector, and then also uh, where we are going to go. Uh, today, I was lecturing uh, this afternoon to the Maryland Sheriff's Association. So you can see this from, from Maryland to Alaska, both sides of our, of our country are talking about what we're talking about here today uh, in, the, in, in Polytechnic. All right, so I liked this phrase because it's, it speaks to what we do as a company, but also the broader spectrum of law enforcement's advancement, of not asking an officer to do something that technology can do for them. So when we started with body-worn cameras in West Lafayette, the first agency in our state to have body-worn cameras in 2012, it was pretty simplistic. There was a sliding door on the camera, and you could see the lens. If you could see the lens, it was on. If you didn't see the lens, it was off. It was that simplistic. Um, the battery life was uh, substandard, maybe didn't last the whole shift. At times, if we were working 12-hour shifts, for sure it didn't last. Uh, docking stations where you had to physically take that camera, put it in a downloading connected system, uh, and upload it to either servers or really not. There was, nothing was cloud-based at that time. Fast forward to where we are today. We're light years ahead of that, but there's, there's still um, technology out there that officers are using that is uh, problematic, uh, not cutting edge, and not uh, probably the best solution for problems that exist uh, where sociology and technology overlap, and uh, I think we're seeing that play out across the country. Um, some of the problems with body-worn cameras historically is, see if I can get here, dependent upon an officer to turn them on, when to turn them on, what policy do you follow, what calls for service, and what law enforcement action necessitates that technological piece to come on to address uh, the transparency, accountability of the sociology piece, right? So you can, uh, that theme I'm kind of weaving here today is the overlap of technology solving today's problems and you guys learning to go forward here and uh, address problems of tomorrow when you leave Purdue University. Uh, the big one is it's a device that hangs on the outside of the officer's uniform. It's subject to being knocked off. Again, I'll point to the events of today. If anybody watched part of the, the Chauvin trial, you saw a video that you didn't see last May. You saw iPhone video of an incident, and it told a certain story uh, that I think we all, we all saw and, and looked at uh, uh, in dismay. But we didn't see video from the officer's perspective because it was protected uh, by the prosecutor for trial is not to taint a jury, is not to uh, prejudice anyone in the process. That's, that's normal. But so in the last few weeks, we saw body camera footage. And one of the things I pointed out right away, uh, because I see it happen all over the country, is the body camera fell off during the struggle. And it's recording the streetlights, and it's not recording what's going on uh, between one of these officers and, uh, and George Floyd. Um, during the incident. So that, that's a real problem that uh, police departments are, are continually dealing with. 
that anything hanging on the outside of the uniform can be yanked off or can fall off during a struggle or, or a foot pursuit even. Uh, availability of video is another big issue with this technology right now. Um, well, docking stations and, and putting, um, uh, waiting till the end of a shift, of a patrol shift, to dock a video and have it offload before it's available for viewing. And all that time, all that while, the video is vulnerable. While it sits on a device, the device can be knocked off, stolen, lost, discarded, and the video is also lost forever. We actually, in West Lafayette, in the early days of an older technology, we lost two video cameras in the field, either on fights or foot pursuits, and that video was lost forever as well. So you can see where this can be problematic. You don't have that, that evidence when you need to have that, e that evidence, right? So uh, there's, there's a better way of doing things with today's technology. And then policy-based recording. Um, this is a new concept that's really uh, been adopted by a lot of our stakeholders in our communities and law enforcement to match technology to policy. Turn the camera on automatically in certain instances. You tell us your department's policy of when they need to record, when officers need to record. And there's automation out there uh, that allows for the automation activation of the body camera. That wasn't just available just a few short years ago. So another thing that I'm weaving here is the evolution of technology. Uh, when you guys graduate here, the, the technology will be at a certain point, and in a couple years from now, whatever field that you go into in technology, you will help advance and continue to advance uh, those technological pieces to make the world better. I hope that's what Purdue's known for. I travel the country. I wear a Purdue ring. I'm on airplanes all the time, and people will recognize, what is that? Did you go to Purdue? And literally, when you get outside of Indiana, people do think that you went to an Ivy League school. I never get that about Indiana, by the way, my undergrad. Okay, so uh, we're talking about the evolution of body cameras here. We're really the evolution of technology because society has demanded technology evolve. Um, just one large piece of activating the body camera uh, that's been perfected, our, our company and a couple others do this as well, is turning on the body camera when an officer pulls their weapon. Would you agree that out of all the things that an officer does, that that one instance of use of force needs to be captured on video? Would we all agree? If there's anything that you do that you have to have the video on, as a former police administrator, uh, I would have nightmares about having an officer involved shooting or use of force involving a firearm and having to go to WLFI, and I've done this, by the way, and say, you know what? We don't have the video of that incident. The officer forgot to turn the camera on. And, and can we blame them? They're in the middle of a life or death situation, and they're taking care of business. They're doing what they're trained to do, and they didn't activate a body cam with the push of a finger. Technology exists to take care of that problem and make sure that we have that transparency and accountability piece. Um, yeah, here's my holster sensor. You can see it just goes on the outside of a holster. Bluetooth activated, goes right to the camera on your chest. Live stream. So when I was in the FBI Academy in 2011, one of the things that happened there while I was there and I think a lot of you were kids back then for sure, uh, Osama bin Laden was killed uh, by a SEAL team. That was live fed across the country or across the planet to a war room in Washington, D.C., where you saw President Obama and Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, watching that live, that raid unfold with uh, SEAL team, right? You guys remember these photos? That was like cutting-edge technology 10 years ago, May of 2011. 
fast forward to today, it's still uh, not very commonplace for our police departments. Um, the availability is there. You can stream it across a, a Wi-Fi network or a cellular network. And there's a couple of companies, one in particular ours, that specializes in giving that live stream, uh, that up-to-date situational awareness of what's going on out on the street, certainly in a, uh, a civil disturbance situation, a tactical situation for a SWAT team. You have a, a command post, and uh, people, decision makers, want to be able to see what's going on live. And that's available today, and it's been available to our military for a while. Uh, <laughs> uploading a video. You can see where this uh, has come a long way, and you, everybody has an iPhone here, and you are constantly trying to improve your upload and download speeds. Um, think about police departments across our country wearing body camera video or, or, or body cameras that they'd have to wait till the end of their shift, and this is still commonplace. Go dock that in a docking station, wait for it to offload, and then have the video available to you to write your report, submit for evidence, uh, submit to uh, uh, command staff for review, what have you. Uh, and today, there are companies that specialize in offloading directly from the device to a cloud, securing the video instantaneously, not worrying about it being lost if the camera's lost because it's already gone. It's secured in a, in a, in a, in a cloud but also having that available for live feed, having it available for officers to review uh, instantaneously for their reports. And then CAD activation, this is a big one. So, uh, and I'm leading up to all these points are, are gonna come together here in a few minutes. Uh, activating the body camera automatically for officers, that's the theme we're talking about here. Activating it when they get a call for service. Has anybody seen the TV show Live PD, right? Been canceled. But um, there was a couple of Indiana agencies on there, Lawrence, Indiana in particular, outside of Indianapolis. And if you, if, uh, if you saw an officer answer a call for service with their microphone in their car, dispatch, I'm en route to that call, and you'd hear recording. That's an automatic activation of a body camera from uh, a CAD call, a computer-aided dispatch, GPS locating the officer in the car and turning on the body camera automatically. How far we've come compared to an officer having to push the button to activate the camera. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll hit this theme. These advances in technology, these pieces of automation, come from universities like this from you all recognizing where we're going, uh, anticipating which the next piece of advancement is, and then working on that piece to solve today's problems and today's necessities. And I say that because our company's based in Georgia, and I have to hear all the time about these engineers from Georgia Tech that are employed at our company, that they develop this, develop that. I'd like to see more Purdue grads in uh, this space in Georgia. But you kind of get the theme, though. These are people not much older than you that are solving the problems and the issues in advancing technology through, uh, through today's issues. Foot pursuit activation is another one. Uh, and it'll make sense here in just a minute when I show you what today's body camera looks like compared to what you've seen in years past. All right. The, the body camera on the right is the traditional body camera that a lot of companies make that hangs on the outside of a uniform uh, that every time there's a, a new piece of technology that comes along, they have to reinvent the body camera because it's a hardware device. And uh, if there's an activation piece, that becomes the 2.0, the 3.0, with a whole new hardware device. And uh, some really smart engineers and technology majors developed the one to the left here, which is 
a smart device, a firmware update device, much like your iPhone, operating a, a smart system, a computer, and adding features, adding updates through uh, the cloud in a, in a firmware update, much like your iPhone does. Uh, and real-time communications, of course. When you have a smart device, you're connected, and you can feed communication to that device to the officers in the field with um, uh, pictures, with uh, bolos, we call them, be on the lookout for. You have a lost child, let's say, and uh, you're at a, a community event, and you can send to every officer uh, on their device the picture of that child and descriptors and, um, and whatever other information that they, they need for that incident. You can also see where that's helpful if you're looking for a suspect as well, getting a picture rather than a description of a six-foot-four whatever. You actually get a picture of somebody, and you can look through a crowd and maybe be a lot more effective, a lot more efficient. All right, come on. So how do we do it? How does technology address these issues? I don't often do this, but I brought a, uh, a body camera with me. A lot of times I'm doing this over Zoom, and this doesn't really work out as well. So, yeah. I'm being respectful here of being recorded. I'm, I'm wired up all over the place. Bear with me. While I'm doing this, please ask me a question. I'm dying up here if you don't ask me a question. Nobody? Got one in the back. Go ahead. Uh, even though these body cameras are released by CGI, the like that they don't show the whole story, uh, they only pick and choose which part that they want to show and not the whole story. Great question. So the availability of body camera video to the media, and then are you talking about the media ed editing? Yeah. So that's a great point. Um, that release of video where you don't have to actually take a disc or a thumb drive to a media outlet or have them come pick it up, this is all just sent on links now, email links, and uh, sharing of video that's required by law. I helped write the law in Indiana for release, redaction, and retention of body camera video back in 2016. And uh, very specific on, on what you're talking about there, but, you know, uh, the media gets to pick and choose often which, how much they, they show you and, and the length of that. Um, you, I guess there's multiple, multiple ways to unpack that, right? But at the end of the day, there are some requirements that, require redaction, I think, uh, that we can all understand. Uh, victims need to be redacted, at least their faces. Oftentimes when you're talking about uh, victims of sexual, offense, sexual crimes specifically. Uh, children uh, certainly need to be redacted as well. In our state, they, they certainly are. Uh, nudity, uh, I think if you, uh, you, you watch cops or Live PD, all that's been redacted for good for good reason. Uh, uh, members uh, of the public that are deceased, uh, dead bodies and such, always redacted. Uh, and and that's where the media doesn't get to pick and choose. That's what's given to them uh, by law. Uh, but the segment on how much they show you, they get to taper off. Uh, that's why in court, I think it's important that we. We, we look at things from the beginning to the end, and I think we saw a lot of that play out here nationally here in the last couple of weeks in Minnesota. So I'm wearing a, a body camera. Uh, this can be done in, in any garment, but I happen to have it in a vest because it's easy. And as you can see, today's police body cameras resemble a cell phone. Why? Think of the R&D that goes into this type of technology. Okay, you have a GPS unit. You have a computer processor. 
you have uh, a gyroscope that knows if it's like this or like this. Why is that important? Uh, body cameras today have a, a feature called officer down that will alert if the officer goes prone in the field and send a GPA, GPS coordinate to their location and send people to help. We actually had a save our company did in St. Louis just this past year. Um, it can also has an accelerometer. It, it knows how fast you're running, how fast you're going, and can activate the body camera based on your speed and based on um, the jostling of the camera. So you can see where technology has gone in the body camera space of leveraging existing technology and bringing it into a space that uh, can use that existing technology and add features to it. This camera here is not a cell phone. It uses the principles and the operating system of an Android device, but it's been locked down by software where you can't make a phone call on it, you can't get a text on it. All those features have been stripped out of it. Uh, but a way of thinking outside the box, what is out there technology-wise that can be leveraged for other uses? Uh, and I think uh, there's some engineers in Georgia that really did a good job on, on patenting that, that technology. Uh, as you can see, you can barely tell that this is a, this is a uh, body camera. The only thing that protrudes is the lens. And uh, it, it also can't be knocked off. And it's a connected device. As long as you have cell service or Wi-Fi connection, it's constantly connected through GPS. It's constantly connected for offloading and, uh, and live time uh, release of, uh, of body camera video as well. Okay, situational awareness. The body cameras of yesterday don't really have the ability to track your assets like your police officers or their squad cars. Uh, you put a smart device on somebody, you can pull up on one map from a web portal anywhere in the world and see where all of your officers are in real time across a jurisdiction, whether it be a state police, a city, a county, and you can have historicals uh, as well as calls for service that they have gone on that day. Leading edge body worn technology. This is a big concept policy-based recording of mirroring, uh, emerging, I should say, technology with policy. It's a concept that's really caught on across the country where a, a police agency, a law enforcement agency, develops a policy of when they want to have body camera video. Every time you have an interaction with the public, maybe only certain calls for service, maybe different uh, policing functions that you absolutely want to have the camera come on for. Uh, you show a company, a technology company, your policy, and there are systems out there that are then customized to your policy to turn the camera on for your jurisdiction when you think that it should come on. And that's the concept that's really caught on across the country. Uh, immediate video offload, we talked about that. That's a new feature that uh, has evolved uh, by the necessity of having the video instantaneously. Uh, Real-time communications, the connected officer. Um, we have several incidents in my career that I can think of, and I spent 25 years policing in this city where we'd call out in the analog days uh, over the radio send an officer on a call for service. And if they didn't answer the call, we started to get worried. You know, Unit 49, your location, no answer, no answer. Maybe they were out on a traffic stop and they didn't answer. And reduced to going out in a geographical district and searching for an officer and hoping you didn't find the worst. And uh, I, I can think of a couple of jurisdictions Indianapolis in particular, where uh, that was not a good outcome when the officer didn't answer the radio. Today, you have real-time situational awareness of an officer's location. They don't answer the radio. They go down in the line of duty, GPS coordinate, alert, live stream to dispatch of why they went down, 
We had an officer in St. Louis last, well, this time last year, last April, uh, for pursuit, uh, suspect in custody, going back to his car by himself, had a heart attack. Young guy, in his 20s. Went down. Uh, the camera did what it was supposed to do. It alerted that the officer went prone after a countdown of, of 30 seconds or less. It, uh, it started a live stream to dispatch that showed that the officer was down. Uh, it became a communications device to talk to the officer, try to, to, to uh, communicate with him. And in this particular instance, GPS his location for other officers to come to his aid. Uh, 24 years old, not much older than most people in here. This happened on a Friday, and on, uh, he was revived and saved. On Monday morning, his wife gave birth to their second child. You can see where technology has come together to solve problems and issues in people's lives. Uh, a very important feature, the connected officer these days. Uh, Computer-based platform. Of course, uh, you saw the situational awareness map. Um, uh, having a back end, uh, this is just hardware, but we all know the, the real piece of the connected officer or the connected technology is the back end software and uh, cloud based, web based, making sure that you have that information instantaneously. Uh, battery life's always an issue when you're working 12 hour shifts. Uh, there will be officers out across our country tonight that are deploying for potential civil unrest that will be out there in the excess of 12 hours. I can promise you that. And will their body camera continue to record if they have to go into overtime, if they have to be there for 16 hours, let's say? Will technology address that issue? Uh, will there be the availability to have video in a civil disturbance if, if, um, if it comes to that? Question? Yes, sir. So, uh, what would like you do in the situation where somehow a criminal would be able to manipulate the camera? Like, what would you guys do in that situation? And that criminal could be. I mean, let's, I'm just going to say it. A criminal could be an officer, right? I mean, they, something's happened, and uh, having a, I don't can't believe that just happened. I now need to, whomever, take that video, that device, and throw it in the river, right? Throw it in the Wabash. Well, uh, just a, a few short years ago, that would have probably been the end of that evidence or the end of that situation. Uh, but the connected device, it's instantaneously offloading from here to the cloud. So even if the device is gone, the video is still there. Um, a lot of people in here from Indiana. Uh, just down the road on 65 is Boone County, right? Lebanon, Zionsville. Boone County Sheriff and I are very good friends. Uh, March of 2018, not that long ago, uh, Deputy Pickett, Pickett was killed in the line of duty. Canine track um, after a, a robbery. And we're in this system. So not that far from home here in West Lafayette, right? Uh, a fatal wound, not survivable, but the system did what it was supposed to. It was connected. The video was secured instantaneously in the cloud. It recorded his murder. It was used in the trial to secure a conviction. Um, the cavalry was sent but it just it didn't work out the way we would have wanted it to work out. I can tell you this, though, that um, just a few short years earlier than that, uh, there might have been an instance to, to make your point where that video could have been taken off the officer and never to be seen again. Um, thank goodness that uh, you all are sitting in these seats and are working on these issues to advance that technology to solve these issues and solve these problems uh, that we're all facing, right? We're more connected than we, than we ever were. 
and then cloud base. We talked about redaction being a very big component and not going the old, we used to redact frame by frame, literally in 2012, go frame by frame and blur out this and that and the other. I'll get to you in just a sec. But now, you know, we have a, um, artificial intelligence in the cloud that can recognize the face, track it throughout the video, and redact it in instantaneously. Yes, sir. Uh, like, how do you test like, the durability of the camera on the top side, like the lens itself, so it didn't crack and then like, make the film blurry, or like, put a new blurry camera on the Like, say someone, say the officer were to fall and the screen were to crack, uh, like, how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? Yeah, and there, there are standards in the industry uh, when you compete for um, um, when you compete for, um, I guess, uh, responses to proposals, there are certain specs that you have to meet, uh, and, and I'm not I'm not that technological a guy, but I can tell you that um, this lens is pretty hard to crack. It's changeable. I can pop it out. Just a plastic holster the lens that unscrews and then you can change these out to have 90 degrees 120 degree 140 degree depending on what your agency wants I was a big believer in here in West Lafayette in the 90 degree because there's studies that show the FBI studies that show that when it hits the fan you have tunnel vision and you can't be held responsible for things outside of here. These are these are well-known studies that you literally lock in to a threat, uh, fight or flight type stuff in our in our DNA. Maybe you have a TAC team, a, a, a SWAT team, right? A tactical team, I'm using lingo here. A TAC team that uh, you want to have in a command center live feed as somebody's hitting a, a drug house or or what have you, whatever the operation is, you want a, a 140 degrees because it's not just the person that's on the ground that's responsible, but you're taking in information live and you want a wide angle. So you can see where there's different uh, scenarios for different technology pieces. Yes, sir. Good question. Great question. So to repeat that, has anybody ever been able to hack a video that's being maybe uploaded or it's already in the cloud? I can't speak for the industry. I can only speak for our company that it's a no. Uh, the FBI sets standards for sieges compliance in order for you to house law enforcement video for evidentiary purposes. It has to meet certain standards of uh, encryption and, uh, and certainly protection. Uh, we house everything in the Amazon government cloud, which is also used by the alphabet soups of the federal government, the DEA, the FBI, and the CIA. Um, so I think West Lafayette's video here in town will be the least worried about if the Amazon government cloud were hacked, right? But um, that's a great, good question because it is vulnerable from the device to, to the upload, right? And there are um, encryption requirements for you to meet in order to use that cloud for storage of law enforcement evidence. Now, I can't answer beyond that. I'm not that guy. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, asking about the weight of the vest and uh, the weight of the cell phone, adding to that, you know, uh, there's been a trend in law enforcement to move things from the belt here to the chest for weight disbursement. Um, not a big fan of that look, by the way. I'm a more of a traditional um, policing uniform, but I get the concept to get it off of the hips because a lot of officers do have um, back problems because of all that weight. So this is really uh, a small piece compared to some of the other equipment the officers have to have to carry every day. Yes, sir. Is there anything that's off the camera from getting out of line with the lens so it doesn't completely hit the field of view? 
Great question. Because in our device, I can tell you this, you're aligning an exterior lens with a built-in camera lens, and there is a, a, a very distinct holster with a notch that locks in with magnets to make sure that it seats. And if this were on and it's not on, you would hear an audible bell tone to know that it's seated properly and that the, the camera is ready to go. Uh, a connected device like that can give you reports instantaneously of uh, a sergeant can sit at roll call now on a laptop and see everybody in the roll call, uh, what their battery life is live, uh, both for the camera and for your holster sensor, and uh, make sure everybody is starting with a, a camera that's turned on, that's functioning properly, that's charged, and ready to go for their tour of duty. That's literally where we at our, where we are today, on the technology spectrum of body cameras. Ah, all right, this is a big piece here. So, uh, our company specializes. I told you in turning. We lead the industry in turning on the body camera automatically, and I'm proud to say uh, that we were recognized about two weeks before the events of Minneapolis, Minnesota last year, by the NAACP National Board of Directors. I've had several great conversations with President Derek Johnson of the NAACP requiring body cameras to have certain features that turn on the camera automatically, eliminating a societal issue of implicit bias and solving that issue through a piece of technology. Okay, kind of take that in and think about that. Um, one of the concerns is fairness and equity that the NAACP works on. And for them to recognize a company's technology to solve these fairness issues and to make sure the, the playing field is level for everybody, that uh, human error and implicit bias doesn't come into play with turning on the body camera, that the camera comes on through a technology piece that comes out of the work that goes on here at institutions like Purdue University. Uh, what an overlap of problems in our, in our communities and society with technological solutions, right? So I'm proud that um, I was part of uh, making that possible, uh, presenting to the National Board of Directors and securing that endorsement uh, and advancing our body camera to solve problems of today. I saw President Johnson, if you guys don't know him, this morning he was on all the talk shows talking about what was going to happen with uh, this verdict today. So uh, I, this couldn't be any more timely uh, with what we're talking about and what our country is going through and solving problems and making sure that we are uh, addressing the concerns of today. And that's my last slide. Uh, please take down my, uh, my email address if you have something that you want to ask uh, offline. Be happy to entertain that question. But I, I really want to open it up for dialogue here and questions. I think most of you are freshmen here at Purdue. And uh, you come from all over our state or all over the country. And we'll have a different lens on some of these issues. I'd like to hear some of your thoughts uh, and, and where you think the next piece of technology needs to, to happen to address issues um, in this market. Somebody, please. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Elected officials. Uh, well, that's a big spectrum there. So are you talking about their acceptance of body cameras? No, I mean just uh, have them record it that way. <laughs> I guess that this is also a movie, but it's pretty much the downfall of that, that car was, I think, pretty much all of it. 
So one of the things I, the question was about recording our politicians. I mean, they're doing the people's business, right? Just as, as law enforcement is. So one of the jobs that I do for our company is specializing in policy and in legislative affairs, legislation. I also um, uh, engage with uh, lawyers from all over the country in our lobbying efforts of our politicians. And uh, one, of those, uh, one of those pieces happens to be presenting to city councils often in state legislatures and, uh, and keeping track of federal legislation. I'm confident that we'll see some police reform this year at the federal level that will encompass requiring body cameras for all federal law enforcement in uniform. Not only body cameras, I've seen the legislation. It didn't get any, anywhere last year, but I think it will this year also requiring uh, dash cameras for federal law enforcement. But originally there was an exclusion except for uh, uniformed officers uh, working on Capitol Hill. I think the events of January and what happened on Capitol Hill will probably change that dynamic and uh, I don't think there'll be any exemptions. Uh, at least I hope there's not in that space. Good, good, good question. I mean, where do we draw the line? I, I don't have that answer. You guys need to have that answer. Yes, sir. So the national dialogue about um, the involvement of police in today's political environment. Could I, I'm supposed to repeat some of this for the camera so that we get it for, for the future classes that see this. Um, you know, law enforcement answers to politicians. Uh, I was an appointed official as a chief of police appointed by a mayor. That's our system here in Indiana. And um, uh, the mayor answers directly to the electorate, right? Uh, so there's an accountability piece there for your law enforcement. Uh, the same way with the sheriff's office. The sheriff is elected by the people and, uh, and, and answers directly to the electorate. So, you know, I don't have an answer for that, but I, I, I do appreciate and recognize, and I think everyone should, that there is political oversight um, and the best thing that I can tell you is to vote. Have a say. Make sure that you're a part of that transparency and accountability piece for your politicians that are dictating policy and are, and are appointing officials that have a lot of influence in your life. I always said all politics are local. Do you think you have more Oh, let's see. And this is true about uh, the use of body cameras. Is there more involvement in government in your life on the local level or on the national level? I would always argue on the local level. Uh, that's the interactions that you have with your government, your police officers, your firemen, your, your mayor, uh, and other city officials, all the way down to who collects your garbage. You know, I like to say all, all, all politics and all government are local. Uh, and then, you know, we have that big turn. I can go on forever on this topic. Big turnouts for national elections when local elections, I think, matter even more. So I'll, I'll leave you with that piece to be involved. Yes, sir. Do you believe body cams are the most important piece of equipment that an officer carries? I can't underscore most important, but I think they are extremely important because they interact with policy. They interact with a specific policy that everybody's concerned about right now, which is use of force, and uh, and how technologically they interact with that use of force policy. Um, a, a technical component on a on a holster for the drawing of uh, a weapon, recording that metadata of when exactly was it pulled, two minutes of pre-record to go back and view automatically why an officer pulled their weapon, uh, the metadata, how long they had it out of their holster, and when they holstered back up, 
Think about all that information that we didn't have available to us just a very short time ago. Uh, a taser, having that same sensor on a taser for the exact same reasons that I just talked about. Uh, I think they are an important part of technology that weaves into all the other um, areas uh, that an officer's day entails now. GPS, um, I can think about running audit reports, going to speak like this to neighborhood associations. Well, you never see an officer in our neighborhood. Well, no, they're probably there when you're sleeping. But being able to have a report that's generated from a GPS locator, so we had this many officers in your neighborhood in the last 30 days at this time, uh, for this long, for this amount of period, all trackable by their body camera. Uh, that reports to a GPS, not just when they're recording, but historically when they're serving. So it's a, it's an overlay that is, uh, uh, catapulted police work into more, uh, professionalism, more efficiency, but also more accountability and transparency by having that data and uh, being able to show what your people are doing daily and consistently. Yes, sir. Well, a conservation officer did what push to have body cams in the city police stations and uh, county police uh, in general. So, uh, good question about conservation officers, state law enforcement coming into the fold of body cameras. Uh, of course, cost is always an issue, and you're dealing with larger organizations like that. Uh, state police agencies historically are a little more traditional, a little less apt to uh, to go with trends, maybe. If you, if you look at the Indiana State Police, they haven't changed their uniform, pick a date, 1940-something or 50-something, still wear a tie, hat. Um, and breaking down some of that um, tradition uh, can be difficult, I think, at times for some agencies. Uh, but I know there's an effort right now uh, to put body cameras on our state police here in Indiana and across the country, and DNR officers play into that as well. Yes, sir. Where in the body cameras increase or decrease the interaction of law enforcement with the public? Don't know. Sounds like a good research project. Um, that, that you know, I didn't mention this. My my research project when I was doing my master's work here at Purdue was police body cameras. I put cameras on our officers for the first time in our state as part of my project here at Purdue. And that's what I mean about coursework affecting what's going on in the real world. And we would measure things and study and gather data like you're talking about. Uh, but I think that's a, that's a good piece. I know there have been studies in California about the effect of body cameras on complaints on officers and on use of force incidents, how they affect those two things. But the overall interaction of law enforcement with the public they serve and the metric and the measure, that sounds like a good master's degree project for you. Might be able to talk a professor into accepting that. And literally, that could be a thesis right there. As you start to think about solving problems and taking something that may be unknown that nobody else has studied, that's what um, uh, I think that's that's what uh, professor works on here to advance uh, Purdue Polytechnic in addressing today's problems uh, with research and studies and uh, solutions uh, answering answering questions and problems. Thank you. I appreciate your time today.